Jensen Jaguars, Miss McLean here, and happy Friday, November the 13th. On Wednesday this week, on November 11th, we had a holiday in honor of Veterans Day. Veterans Day is a day set aside to honor the men and women who served in the armed forces to protect our country. November is also Native American Heritage Month. So today we're going to learn about some special contributions that were made by Native American veterans who served in the U.S. Marines during World War II. As early as 1915, Native Americans began to advocate for a First Americans Day. In fact, the Boy Scouts began recognizing First Americans Day during this time. But it wasn't until November 1990 that the United States Congress chose the month of November to recognize Native Americans. The reason they did this is that November concludes the traditional harvest season for Native Americans and is generally a time of tribal gatherings and celebrations. Native Americans live in every part of the Americas, both North and South, and they have their own cultural traditions and languages that have existed here for thousands of years. However, Native American lives have not always been valued and respected by the settlers in the Americas and what is today the United States. Have you ever created a secret code or language with your friends? Using a code is a way to communicate information other than the language you speak. Today I want to share some information about the Navajo, who are a Native American tribe who currently live in Arizona, New Mexico, and southeastern Utah. Their language was not a written language, and very few people who are not Navajo have ever learned to speak their language since it is very difficult. It sounds like a perfect language to use as a secret code, right? Well, the United States government sought the same thing. In World War II in the 1940s, the countries who were fighting were doing everything to keep their plans secret, but it was very hard to do since the enemy was always breaking the codes. So the United States government decided that they wanted to bring young Navajo men into the military to create a secret and unbreakable code using the Navajo language. Around 400 young Navajo men worked between the years of 1942 and 1945 to create a 400 word secret code that was unbreakable and used to ultimately win World War II in the Pacific. The men who created these codes are called the Navajo Code Talkers and are to be remembered for their important contributions to our country. Next week, I'm going to have a special Jaguar segment on Native Americans and the important contributions they have made to our history here in the United States. Keep getting out there and making those positive contributions in your family and in our community. Today we have Island Eppelman who's going to be helping us with Friday Flag. Take it away, Islet. Please rise. Take your hats and hands off. Put your, place your right hand over your heart. Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic of which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and, de and justice for all. You may be seated. As a Jensen Jaguar, I pledge to P, give my personal best. A, act responsibly. W, we show respect. S, put First, together we make Jensen Ranch positive. Go make it a positive day. This week's story is The Unbreakable Code by Sarah Hoagland Hunter and illustrated by Julia Minor. John raced up the hill, sending pebbles skidding behind him. When he reached his favorite hiding place, he fell to the ground out of breath. Here, between the old pinion tree and the towering walls of the canyon, he felt safe. 
The river, full of late summer rain, looked like a silver thread winding through his grandfather's farmland. They would be looking for him now, but he was never coming down. His mother had married the man from Minnesota. There was nothing he could do about that, but he was not going with them. He closed his eyes and rested in the stillness. The faint bleat of a mountain goat echoed off the canyon walls. Suddenly, a voice boomed above him. Shouldn't you be packing? John's eyes flew open. It was his grandfather on horseback. Your stepfather's coming with the pickup in an hour. I'm not going, John said. You have to go. School's starting soon, said Grandfather, stepping down from his horse. You'll be back next summer. John dug his toe deeper into the dirt. I want to stay with you, he said. Grandfather's soft brown eyes disappeared in the wrinkles of a smile. John thought they were the kindest eyes he had ever seen. You're going to be all right, Grandfather said. You have an unbreakable code. What's that? asked John. Grandfather sat down and began to speak gently in Navajo. The sounds wove up and down, in and out, as warm and familiar as the patterns of one of grandmother's Navajo blankets. John leaned his head against his grandfather's knee. The unbreakable code is what saved my life in World War II, he said. It's the Navajo language. John's soldiers sagged. Navajo couldn't help him. Nobody in his new school spoke Navajo. I'll probably forget how to speak Navajo, he whispered. Navajo is your language, his grandfather said sternly. Navajo, you must never forget. The lump in John's throat was close to a sob. You don't know what it's like there, he said. His grandfather continued quietly in Navajo. I had to go to a government boarding school when I was five. It was the law. They gave me an English name and cut my hair off. I wasn't allowed to speak my language. Anyone who spoke Navajo had to chew on squares of soap. Believe me, I chewed a lot of soap during those years. Speak English, they said, but Navajo was my language and Navajo I would never forget. Every summer, I went home to herd the sheep and help with the crops. I cried when the cottonwoods turned gold and it was time to go back. Finally, one night, in 10th grade, I was working in the kitchen when I heard a bulletin on the school radio. Navajos needed for special duty to the Marines. Must be between the ages of 17 and 32, fluent in English and Navajo, and in excellent physical condition. Just before lights out, I snuck past the bunks and out the doors towards the open plain. I felt like a wild horse with a lasso finally off its neck. Out in the open, the stars danced above, and the tumbleweeds blew by my feet as I ran. The next day, I enlisted. But you weren't 17, said John. The reservation had no birth records, Grandfather said with a grin. Two weeks later, I was on a bus headed for boot camp with 28 other Navajos. I stared out the window into the darkness. I was going outside of the four sacred mountains for the first time in my life. Were you scared? asked John. Of course, said his grandfather. I didn't know where I was going or what our special mission was. Most of all, I didn't know how I would measure up to the people out there I had heard so much about. How did you? asked John, chewing on his fingernail. His grandfather began to laugh. We were known as the toughest platoon at boot camp. We had done so much marching at boarding school that the drills were no problem. Hiking in the desert of California with a heavy pack was no worse than hauling water in the canyon in midsummer. And I'd done it since I was four years old. As for the survival exercises, we all had gone without food for several days. A Navajo learns to survive. One week, they bust us to a new camp in San Diego. On Monday, we were marched to a building with bars on every window. They locked us in a classroom at the end of a long, narrow corridor. An officer told us our mission was top secret. We would not even be allowed to tell our families. 
we were desperately needed for a successful invasion of the Pacific Islands. So far, the Japanese had been able to intercept and decode all American radio messages in only a matter of minutes. This meant that no information could pass between American ships, planes, and land forces. The government thought the Navajo language might be the secret weapon. Only a few outsiders had ever learned Navajo. Most importantly, the language had never been written down, so there was no alphabet for anyone to discover and decode. He gave us a list of more than 200 military terms to decode. Everything had to be memorized. No trace of the code could ever be found in writing. It would live or die with us in battle. When the officer walked out of the room, I looked at the Navajo next to me and began to laugh. All those years they told us to forget Navajo, and now the government needs it to save the country. We were marched every day to the classroom. We were never allowed to leave that building. We couldn't even use the bathroom by ourselves. Each night, an officer locked our notes in a safe. The code had to be simple and fast. We would only have one chance to send each message. After that, the enemy would be tracing our location to bomb us or trying to record the code. We chose words from nature that would be easy to remember under fire. Since Navajo has no alphabet, we made up our own. A became Wallachi. Aunt? asked John in English. Grandfather nodded. B was shush. Bear, John said. C was mosi. Cat. His grandfather continued through the alphabet. Each time he named the Navajo word, John answered with the English. We named the aircraft after birds. The dive bomber was a chicken hawk. The observation plane was an owl. A patrol plane was a crow. Bomber was buzzard. At night, we would lie in our bunk beds and test ourselves, and soon I began to dream in Navajo code. Because we were going to be operating radios, we had to learn how to operate them and take them apart blindfolded. We were taught to work in complete darkness. We had to test the code in front of the top marine, and I was very scared. I was handed a written message that I had to translate. We are under fire. We request reinforcements. It took me only seconds for me to speak the Navajo code. The accuracy of my message was checked. The Navajo on the other end handed the exact message transcribed in English. They continued to test our code and every time it was a success. It was so successful that the U.S. government requested 200 more Navajo recruits. Tell me about the fighting, said John. Suddenly, Grandfather's face looked as creased and battered as the canyon walls behind him. After a long pause, he said, What I saw is better left back there. I would not want to touch my home or my family with those pictures. When we went to war, we saw beautiful islands had been destroyed in the Pacific. All I could think about was trying to stay alive and do my job. My pack was heavy with my radio equipment and I couldn't stop to help anyone. I had to stay focused on my job to deliver radio codes in Navajo. Because of my dark skin and hair, and I was speaking in a foreign language, some American soldiers didn't believe I was on their side. So my life was often in danger. How did you stay alive the rest of the time? asked John. My beliefs protected me, Grandfather answered. More than 400 Navajo code talkers fought in some of the most difficult battles in World War II. All but a few of us survived. Our enemy never did crack the code as hard as they tried. Navajo code talkers were there when the Americans raised our flag on the island of Iwo Jima. When I came home, I walked the 12 miles from the bus station to this spot. There weren't any parades or parties. I knew I wasn't allowed to tell anyone about the code. I looked down at the beautiful canyon floor and thought, I am never leaving again. But why did you leave in the first place? asked John. His grandfather lifted him gently onto the horse. 
The answer to that is in the code, he said. The code name for America was our mother. You fight for what you love. You fight for what is yours. He swung his leg behind John and reached around him to hold the reins. Keep my wallet, he said. It will remind you of the unbreakable code that once saved your country. John clutched the wallet with one hand and held the horse's mane with the other. He wasn't as scared of going to a new place anymore. His grandfather had taught him who he was and what he would always have with him. He was the grandson of a Navajo code talker, and he had a language that had once helped to save his country. The End